death is no big deal. It should be a celebration. It should be a party. So uh, with that, those good thoughts, we took in some of this. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Alan Bach. Good afternoon. Am I coming through? Um, what a wonderful group of people. I love hearing your stories each time I come here. Um, you would think that uh, people who've come close to death would have uh, a lot of sadness and so on. It's actually, I fi always find it most uplifting to hear everybody's stories here. Of course, there are also people here who are in the midst of suffering from a tragic loss, and I hope that um, what you learn here today uh, eventually be of some help to you. Um, it's, it's also nice um, that there, I heard three, four, or five EMDR therapists in the group. Um, I think that's great. I, ho I hope you see some value in this, and if you do, um, we have a lot to talk about. Um, a number of people today mentioned uh, the loss of uh, fathers, and that kind of hits home for me and my family right now because my father had suffered a ma massive stroke um, a couple weeks ago and he doesn't seem to be recovering really well and I think we're getting close to a time where we're going to lose him and so I love you dad and it's interesting hearing the people here who have had near-death experiences out of all the people in my family the only one that's had a near-death experience is my mother. And she happens to be sitting over here right now. She kept her near-death experience quiet for many years until right around the time I think I was reading Raymond Moody's first book and I started asking people about whether they had experiences like that and my mom said, yes, I had one. <laughs> And, of course, I've, I've had her uh, retell her experience a number of times. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. But it's interesting, out of everybody in the family, I think my mom is showing the most courage and the most wisdom around what's going on with my father right now. And I'm sure that's absolutely directly related to her near-death experience. So thank you for being so strong, Mom. Um, I've, I've, um, I've given a talk here a couple times over the years in the past, and the way I did that was I kind of had a, a whole script written out that I followed very closely, and it pretty much took almost 90 minutes, and we had only a little time for questions at the end and people didn't get to ask the questions they wanted to ask. So today, um, I just have a few notes, a few things I want to make sure I hit and explain to you. And then I want to open this up for questions because I think that's um, where people can learn the most, particularly for something like this. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the three categories of uh, things I'm going to talk about today are PTSD, EMDR, and IADC. Any of that sound familiar? IADC. Um, but anyways, I will sort through this alphabet soup for you, and by the end of an hour or so, um, you'll have a good idea what all this means. Um, I worked for over 20 years at the VA hospital in North Chicago treating combat veterans with severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I retired from the VA in 03 and that was right around the time I started writing my book and I opened a private practice at the time. Um, PTSD is a very complex disorder. Um, the simplest way to uh, put it is that when people have a traumatic memory, 
they just don't remember what happened, but they also relive what happened emotionally. In other words, in fact, I, I worked with World War II vets whose trauma, traumas were many decades in the past, but when they brought up their traumatic experiences, they felt like they were reliving it all over again. For the first 10 years or so on the VA, we used what was called a cognitive, cognitive behavioral method, um, or specifically called exposure. The idea was to have the patient talk about and or re-experience their traumatic event in a safe and supportive environment. The, the, theory, the theory behind it was repeated discussion or re-experiencing of the trauma should over time cause the intense emotional response to diminish. And while there were many scientific studies that supported exposure therapy, um, I later came to believe that while the, that there's a big difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. So even though we we're making a little bit of uh, progress with these, with these PTSD vets, most deserving PTSD vets, um, it really wasn't making any big difference in their lives. So, in, in some sense, the, the, our brains get stuck when we experience a traumatic event. And that part of the brain that stuck replays and replays over the years in its original form. So, after years of very painful work, not only for our veterans, but for um, our staff, it was pretty much of a burnout position. Um, even though we felt like we were, we were dedicated to helping these guys the best we could, um, and looking back on it now, I think really all we were doing was giving them um, a place where they could get support from staff and other vets and without being judged at the same time. And then they also found out that there were other people like them experiencing the same kind of symptoms. Is this, is, I'm getting a funny feedback. Oh, no, it's all right. <laughs> Okay. Now, when EMDR first came out, the results that we began to get when we first started using it were dramatic and right off the bat, they were tremendous. We found out that in a single session, we could often remove the reliving component from the memory. But, which is what we couldn't do that if we worked for 10 years using exposure therapy, but in one session, Patients would say things like, Doc, you know, this is strange, but I can remember what happened, but I feel like it happened a long time ago and it's finally over. Oh my God. The first time we saw that, we, 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 were, we couldn't believe it. it was so great. And we, we would have sessions with, uh, with our veterans and we'd be so, so thrilled. We'd go running down the hall and into a my colleague's office and we'd high five, I got another one today. <laughs> Absolutely changed everything. Can you say what EMDR, what it means? Oh, um, eye movement desens desensitization and reprocessing. We call it eye movement for short. The way it works is you have the patient sitting in front of you, and while he or she attends to a certain aspect of the traumatic memory, you have the patient track with his or her eyes back and forth, usually a moving hand like this. So the patient is, is paying attention to something that's going on internally and moving, moving their eyes at the same time. What that does, and the first time we heard that, we thought it, was, it sounded ridiculous. You know, we were psychologists with many years of experience, experience treating PTSD, and you're going to wave your hand in front of somebody's face and they're going to get better? <laughs> Come on. Um, but anyway, as it turns out, uh, 
EMDR, as of today, is the most neuroscience-based procedure, psychotherapy, that's out there, of course. It, that was driven by the fact that there was something about moving the eyes that was causing people to change, and that got people looking inside the brain and finding out what was going on. I went to a two-day neurobiology workshop on EMDR a couple months ago. We know so much more about the brain now, and a lot of it is because of EMDR. One of the best explanations we have going is that EMDR, or eye movements, are in some way related to dream or REM sleep. When we are asleep and dreaming, our brains are processing and integrating information more rapidly than when we're awake. And it's been known for some time that this increased processing during dreaming causes our eyes to dart back and forth, which is why dream sleep is called rapid eye movement or REM sleep. The discovery of EMDR, which is not mine, is Dr. Francine Shapiro in the late 80s. Um, this discovery seemed to suggest that you could take a fully awake person and you can get her to move her eyes in a similar fashion. We can actually put the brain into that higher processing mode when people are wide awake. And at the same time, the frontal lobes and the other higher order functions of the brain remain involved in, in, the, in the processing as opposed to dream sleep. So, EMDR absolutely changed our professional lives at the VA hospital. Now, there were some things about EMDR that I wasn't so thrilled about, even though it, it was a super-powered psychotherapy that did dramatic, wonderful things. There were some parts about the actual eight-step protocol that just didn't make any sense to me. So I started to experiment. Most of my ideas didn't work, um, but I hit on about five or six changes to the standard EMDR protocol that just made it work a lot better. One of those changes, and this is kind of a, um, from a psychological point of view, is very important. One of the biggest changes I made was that when people are in grief or they've experienced a trauma, there are generally a variety of emotions that go with that. For, for, for example, if, some, if, there's a, if a, a traumatic death is involved, there's often sadness, or there's always sadness, there's often guilt, and there's often anger. And people have irrational cognitions. That they don't think logically or reasonably about the event. Well, traditional approaches emphasize different, different points in that. Some, some, some approach uh, trauma therapy by trying to change the way a person thinks. I think that's absolutely the, 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 the least likely thing that's going to provide anybody any help. People don't suffer from trauma or grief because of irrational thinking. And you can't think your way out of it. You've got to process the deep emotions. Well, I came up with this thing called core focus DMDR, which means I also ignored the outer layers of anger and guilt, and I went right after the sadness. <coughs> And I found that when I could process the sadness completely with the eye movements, the guilt and anger disappeared without even being addressed. And so did the irrational cognitions. In other words, you hit the, hit the center of the target, the sadness, you get the whole thing. So I call um, sadness, um, I, I believe sadness is at the very core of all grief. If someone says, well, I'm not really, you know, if something awful, ha uh, someone experienced a terrible uh, loss, and they say they're not sad, I generally interpret that to mean they're not willing to talk about it or don't want to tell me they're, or admit to it. Or they're stuck, or they're very much stuck on anger, on levels of anger and guilt. So actually, when I was at the VA, we, I literally, when I was doing uh, this, we were had, uh, the sessions lasted 10 or 15 minutes and we were done. We simply went right after the sadness, the core sadness, or the, or the other core emotion that needs to be directly addressed is fear. And of course, some traumas have both fear elements and sadness traumas. You, you're afraid you're going to die and someone else does die. 
psychologically, that trauma is really two traumas, and each of those core feelings need to be treated separately. The other, another change I made to standard EMDR is I had the patient close his eyes after each set of eye movements. Now, I, the only reason I did that is, is patients I worked with who spontaneously closed their eyes did better. So I started instructing all my patients to close their eyes and then everybody started doing better. But I also didn't realize where this was leading me is the closing of the eyes was important for the next thing that happened, which I completely and accidentally stumbled on. I was working with a, a Marine named Sam, and he became, and this is in my book, it was the, the very first case I did accidentally. I was working with Sam, and he became uh, very close to an orphaned Vietnamese girl at his base camp. And they developed a very strong father-daughter relationship, and Sam had plans to, to bring Lee, her name, home and, and adopt her. In fact, he had even called his wife back home, and she was all for it. But anyway, he, he didn't know that there was no way the U.S. military was going to allow that, but he made, he, that's what he thought. So I'm working with Sam, and I'm working on his core sadness, and he's shaking violently in his chair and he's sobbing. I think he almost fell out of his chair at one point. And my job at that point is to keep him processing. Good job, Sam. Good job, Sam. Stay with me. Stay with me. Attaboy. Attaboy. And I coached him through the processing of that sadness. And the sadness eventually came down and he closed his eyes. And I just sat there looking at Sam. So I'm watching Sam, and I'm watching the last few tears roll, roll off his cheeks, and a big smile comes over his face. I thought that was odd. And he opened, when he opened his eyes, he told me that Lee had appeared to him as a grown woman dressed in a beautiful white gown with long, beautiful black hair and surrounded by the most beautiful white light he's ever seen. He also said they talked to each other privately. S Sam said, I love you, Lee, and Lee said, I love you too, Sam, and then Lee reached out and gave Sam a hug. Sam, I remember him even saying, I could actually feel her arms around me. Well, That was a wonderful thing that happened looking back on it, but at the time, I didn't know what to think. As a matter of fact, I thought Sam had hallucinated. <laughs> Which is not a good thing, given the intensity of the emotional stress he had just been through. I thought he may have just psychologically deteriorated. I was worried. But anyway, he sort of skipped out of my office full of joy. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know what to think. So anyway, I, I checked in on him later in the day. Sam was still doing fine. And so at the change of shift, before I went home that day, I alerted the nursing staff for the... Oh, oh, the night night to her uh, EPM staff, um, keep an eye on Sam. I'm worried about him. Well, when I got in the next morning, the staff reported that not only was Sam doing just fine, he was actually, they hadn't seen him so happy ever on, that, on the unit. Then he goes home, and he had a daughter at home. He goes home on a weekend pass. He had a daughter at home um, who he completely avoided. Sam lived in the basement, and he just completely avoided any kind of interactions with his daughter because when he did interact with his daughter, that, that interaction triggered traumatic memories of Lee's death. So he just avoided 
though anyway sam goes home that weekend without any counseling or support or instruction sam reestablishes a relationship with his daughter who was a little hesitant to fully accept what that sam's advances but i remember sam said he, he, I'm, I remember, I remember him saying when he got back, I'm making up for lost time. But anyway, that was the very first accidental ADC. I didn't even know what an ADC was. I knew what an MDE was because I had read Raymond Moody's books and so on. And a lot of a lot of the what my patients were reporting you know did sound like ndes there was a lot of overlap between the two um but anyway it was soon after that i found bill guggen bill and Ju judy guggenheim's book hello from heaven they had a couple thousand cases of AD, of spontaneous adcs um in the book and I, that was an oh my God experience for me. These are the same experiences my patients are reporting. And, that, and after Sam, it wasn't just Sam, more and more of my patients began reporting this. And they all, they all got better. And then I start thinking, boy, not only is this not a bad thing, wouldn't it be nice if more of my patients could experience this? <laughs> the healing was truly remarkable. Um, so anyway, about 15% of my patients were having this ADC experience, which I learned that's what the Guggenheims had called it, and I started calling them ADCs also then. Um, other patients were reporting it. About 15%. So I had 15% of my patients were reporting this ADC, and 85 were not. So I went back and looked at my notes to see if I could see anything different. If I had done any, anything differently that had caused this experience to happen. And I was going through, I was looking, looking, looking. And there it was. It was as clear as day. I, I did do something differently, and it was really simple. I offered one more set of eye movements without any instruction. No suggestion, no nothing. Just here, have another one. And then they would close their eyes, and then this very natural experience would occur. Oh, after death communication, it's an experience that people believe involves some kind of connection or communication with a deceased person. Now, I am absolutely convinced that there's something about NDEs, ADCs, IADCs, which I call the experiences my patients have, and what, that's what I call my therapy, induced after-death communication. And there's something called nearing death awareness or deathbed visions, NDAs or deathbed visions. People before death frequently report you know, um, similar kinds of experiences. I am absolutely convinced that out of all the evidence we have, you know, for the for the afterlife hypothesis, NDEs, ADCs, NDAs, and IADCs. Could you go over that again? <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> Near death experience, NDE, ADC, after death communication. IADC, induced after death communication, which is really an ADC, and NDA, nearing death awareness, which is another term for deathbed visions. These are experiences that occur spontaneously, except for my IADC, occur spontaneously without expectation, they come out of nowhere, and they happen under a variety of different circumstances, and pretty much everybody's reporting the same thing. <coughs> now, in my job, I don't go around saying IADCs, IADCs prove the existence of an afterlife. Back Proof's a bad word. I think proof is a mathematical term more than anything else. In, in, in science, we don't prove anything. But it seems to me 
when you consider the NDEs, ADCs, IADCs, NDEs, that's the strongest evidence we have for the afterlife hypothesis, I believe. Now, people ask me, interview me, and go, Doctor, what do you think? Do you think people are really talking to dead people? And so on, and my answer is always, why are you asking me? I'm a psychologist. <laughs> go ask the people who have had the experience. The people who have had the experience are the only ones that can give you a truly informed opinion of that. And it's the same for you who have had NDEs. I imagine you've had doctors trying to talk you out of it, saying you're, you hallucinated, and, 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 but to you, you know differently. It's the same thing where people experience ADCs. Somebody gave an example, I forget who today, when we were passing around the microphone, he had an ADC during sleep and was absolutely convinced that it was real. Now, eight, just looking at NDEs and, AD, and IADCs. Now, IADCs tend to be a little bit more elaborate than ADCs. Because spontaneous ADCs kind of come and go. It's like you're driving down the street and the car passes, you go in the other direction and so, oh yeah, I know that guy. That's kind of how some spontaneous ADCs are. They're real fleeting like that. Well, in IADC, it's more like inviting that person over for lunch. You can sit down and have a conversation. Once you induce the experience, it's very easy to, to, to induce it again and again and again. You keep going back. I'll, I'll ask my patient, do you, have, do you have anything you want to say? Do you have any questions? Okay, let's do that. But there's, uh, there's no suggestion involved. As a matter of fact, I have two, two approaches. One is my formal approach. I see people for two days um, on Saturdays and Sundays, and that's generally enough time to get through one major loss or trauma. Um, but people come in with a lot of expectations, especially people who have a lot of beliefs about the afterlife. In fact, those people are harder to work with. Atheists are easier. <laughs> Because when it gets to the point of inducing that state of receptivity where this natural experience can then happen, you can't force it or make it happen. You just kind of let it happen. Um, if you have a lot of strong beliefs, those expectations and beliefs get in the way of that getting in a receptive mode. So what I do is I actually have two inductions. Day two, I go through the formal procedure. What would you want to say? Da 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 da. But on day one, when I have an idea that all the sadness, all the main pieces of sadness have been processed, I do my induction, which I call my sneaking up method. <laughs> which is, if, if the sadness is coming down, people generally feel very peaceful. They're feeling good. How do you feel? I feel just so, I feel a lot of relief. Good. Notice that relief and just go wherever it takes you. <laughs> Boom. ADC. Now, if I ever said, you know, I'm going to give you a set of eye movement and you're going to see your, your deceased father, it's not going to work. Or I want you to try to picture him, it's not going to work. Spontaneous ADC researchers are, are very slow to accept what I do because they, by definition, many of them believe that all real and true ADCs are spontaneous. We have no control over them whatsoever. They're a gift from heaven. Well, my response to those people is, in IADC, we actually don't induce an ADC. We induce a state of mind that allows the ADC to then naturally occur. And once the ADC starts to occur, we have no control over it. Matter of fact, the deceased person once in a session had a message for me, which I get now and then, and the person said, don't fool yourself, we're always in control, not you. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Made perfect sense. So, 
My interest and what I'm sure of is this heals people in grief, traumatic grief, normal bereavement. It heals people to a degree that we had thought was not possible. And I, there are hundreds of other trained IABC therapists out there who I'm sure would say the exact same thing. So I don't want to get distracted by saying I have proof of the afterlife and you know get on this the, and, 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 and join the battle between the believers and the non-believers. I want nothing to do with that. Go talk to my patients, see what they think. And plus, I don't see it as my job as a psychologist to put my beliefs on the people I work with. That's a people come in with their own beliefs and should you know should leave with their own beliefs and make their own decisions about that. It's not my job to convince people of what I believe. That's not what a psychologist does. Um, my goal is to get this mainstreamed. <coughs> I don't want it to remain sort of on the fringe um, where only fringe people come and see me. I want this for everybody. And again, you don't have to believe in this stuff for it to work. So what I need is science behind this. My very first article came out in the spring 2000 edition of the Journal of Near-Death Studies. And I think Di Diane has had a, a copy of that on her website for years. I'm happy to say that I've uh, trained people from all over the world. We have, I've trained about 400. 200 are on my website and available. I told somebody once that I, I have an, a trained IADC therapist on every continent. And somebody, and the person looked at me and said, you have an IADC therapist in Antarctica? <laughs> I said, no, I forgot. <laughs> that you mean. <laughs> um, I want to get this mainstreamed, and I'm happy to report that we are getting some science behind it as we speak. Um, I'm happy to report that there is now an Allen Botkin Institute in Saarbrücken, Germany. Um, IADC is big in Germany, just like Jerry Lewis was big in France. Um, and the Germans are doing a wonderful job with this, and it's, it's, I think it's growing, IADC is growing faster in Germany than it is in the United States. I have two studies that will soon be out in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit. Are there any brain imaging studies? I'm about to get to that. Um, two studies about to be published. One is an analysis performed by Professor Mo Hanna at uh, Siena College in New York. She did a statist statistical analysis of 71 of my cases, and I had some follow-up to go with that. And I developed my own grief questionnaire to track a person's progress both before and after therapy, and then at six months, and I'm happy to report that um, we got great statistical differences on every item on the grief questionnaire. People, in fact, did get better in, in a number of ways. And it held up over six months. The second study is I did a, a survey of people I had trained a few years ago and wanted to find out how they were doing. And the good news is, is people I train do just as well as I do. It's a very teachable, robust method. I have no special powers whatsoever, I promise. <laughs> there is also, um, Dr. Davida Street is working with people at the University of Virginia. And she has already begun to do a very sophisticated EEG analysis of people going through IADC therapy. She has done, um, uh, she has worked with me for a couple of those, and she's now working with a psychologist in 
um, Florida. And they've run a number of cases down there. So we're going to get to find out what's going on inside the brain when people are both processing their sadness and starting to feel better and, um, and what's going on when people are having these after-death communications. And logically, if it's the same phenomenon, but from a different point of view as an NDE, we also logically can make, maybe learn some things about the NDE experience, which of course is very difficult to induce and very unethical. <laughs> Again, I see people on Saturdays and Sundays. That's generally enough. Um, I, when people call me on a Tuesday morning, if you want a business card, I do have some up here. Um, call me on a Tuesday morning between 10 a.m. and noon. I'm always sitting by my phone and taking calls, doing scheduling. And, I'll, and if you want to come in for therapy, I'll also do a brief screening. Or if you want, if you are, have level one EMDR training already, you want to come in for training, a one-day training, um, give me a call, we'll set it up. Um, when I do screen people, there are some reasons why uh, IADC is not appropriate for that person. One has to do with the recency. How long ago did this person die? Um, as you may know, in the early stage of grief is characterized by shock, disbelief, emotional numbing. People in that early stage of grief are not near ready to really aggressively go after their sadness. If you want to, like, a, 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 a baseball figure, I would say generally six months is a cutoff, but some people are ready at three months and some people aren't ready at eight months. It all has to do with the availability of the person's sadness. People who lose children, it's oftentimes more complicated. There are more pieces of sadness that need to be worked on. And even in, case, in those cases, sometimes it even makes sense to wait a year. The other issue is depression. You EMDR therapists out there know that it's very difficult to do EMDR with somebody who's depressed. Because it's like three steps forward, two steps backwards. It's like, it's like trying to get somebody to run, run a race and they have a ball and chain on their ankle. So it, now, when I talk to people, it's, some people say, well, how, how do you know it's depression or grief? I mean, what's the difference? Well, the symptoms overlap quite a bit. People who are depressed feel sad, people in grief feel sad, and so on and so forth. But I am convinced that they're actually two completely separate causes. Grief is a psychological response to a loss. And I believe depression is biochemical. And my favorite question to ask people to make that differential is, are you able to enjoy the experience? the experiences you used to enjoy before so-and-so died. In other words, if a woman played tennis three times a week and loved playing tennis before her son died, um, if she's only in grief, she may be out there playing tennis and find herself, even if only momentarily, getting caught up in the game and enjoying herself and laughing, and then she'll go sit down and think, oh my God, and then she'll start thinking about her son and get sad and start crying again. But people in grief have those moments where they can break out because it's a psychological response to a loss. Depressed people, however, are flat across the board. So if people are depressed, and I find that out when I do the screening, then I advise they get on a good antidepressant, and I do have some favorites I advise people to get on. Matter of fact, if they are on one of the older antidepressants, I say, ask your family doctor to try you on this one. Then I say, after you come and see me for IADC therapy, you may not need to stay on it. But while you're working with me in therapy, you can't be depressed because it's too hard to make progress. I remember I worked, it's, it's almost impossible to get somebody depressed to process sadness and then have an ADC. And I remember I worked in somebody's world depressed and he had an ADC. 
And he's like, so what? <laughs> That's the depression talk. The other thing is, is it's very important that when I work with somebody that I am always working on the most distressing issue first. In the EMDR therapists know that if, if, if you work on uh, an issue that's less distressing and you start to do the eye movement, you're going to pull up the most distressing issue, so you might as well plan on it and, and, and go in that direction. I covered the main stuff. <laughs> Marty, do you want to say a few words? It's up to you. So I told you earlier that I, I did go to Dr. Bodkin just three weeks ago. And, and I just had, uh, it, was, it was just life changing. It was such a, a great gift. Uh, I'm not new to grief. I've lost two husbands and my, both my parents and various friends. But then when I lost my son, it was just really to cancer, you know, and, and I had to nurse him. It was too much. And that was four and a half years ago. And, and so, in, in uh, the fall, Julia Sante came here. And many of you remember Julia Sante. Uh, her book, The Last Frontier, is a very important book. And Dr. Hawkins was mentioned when she was here. So I looked him up on, uh, and I, oh, I, I bought, uh, bought one of the DVDs of your previous talks and decided to go in and try this. Um, Julia Sante's book the, is called The Last Frontier, and and I think it just describes this this uh, approach where you're at so well. I mean, to me, this is like Dr. Bodkins is like Christopher Columbus. You know, it it, it it's a new world. It's a new world. This is the unexplored world. It's the world that it's the frontier that that human beings have been afraid to to work with and to explore and i'll tell you why i think we're we're ready for it now we're, we're approaching readiness because of meditation because meditation is becoming so popular and that is a is a very good groundwork for you to experience that you're you are more than your body you know, in any kind of meditation, what you do is you, something, something you, tries to stop your mind from working. It tries to quiet your mind. And I, I've done focusing too, and focusing we talk about self and presence, and uh, that's me looking at my experiences. I, I've learned from this that the mind really is a computer. And I am not my mind. I use my mind. I use my mind. And so the more that you or any of us can experience this, that we are consciousness. And, and we do this in meditation without, you know, we put the body to sleep, so to speak. The, the, God, the body gets t quiet, and then we quiet the mind. And then, and then, unfortunately, in meditation, you just sit there and do nothing. But yeah, that's the goal. I'm sorry of meditation is to empty your mind, and they miss the you know they're missing the point. Then you go on. Then you go on. Then you're open. Then you're open, and that's what this eye movement thing, simple as it sounds, does. And it, to me, it was like it was like uh, loosening up these images. It, 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 the images we get from something traumatic are like like a photo. We took a photo. And we keep looking at it, and looking at it, and remembering it, and we build it up with emotions, like building a snowman, bigger and bigger, and, and judgments, it was terrible, it was terrible, whatever. And it just gets stronger. And, uh, 
in the, the eye movement thing, while you're you're experiencing whatever it is, and you're and you're doing the eye movement thing, it just it was just like brushing it away or erasing it or shaking it out, so that you could just be there with that particular moment and in the past and be free. You could be free now, and once you're free, that's when the communication comes from from. Uh, I think it's important not to call these these people in our lives dead, because there's nothing dead about the non-physical. They're not dead. They're they're just non-physical. And so I had five five different experiences in which my son spoke to me. He had a wonderful sense of humor in this life and in the other life. He had a wonderful sense of humor and. So I don't, I don't want to tell you every single one of them, but um, let's see, I will tell you one, one that was very helpful. Um, Dr. Potkin said, after I had done various other ones, he said, what else? What else do you, do you remember that you're dealing with about your son? I said, well, I remember my body remembers being exhausted and taking care of him. I was just exhausted. And I remember the loss of my time. I've spent a lot of time taking care of him, and then after he died, cleaning up all the stuff, and I've done that with other people, and it's like, those are real losses, the loss of my health, and my own health and energy and, and my time. So, so we did the eye movement while I, while I sit in this, in the, being with this feeling. Then I closed my eyes, and my son was there, and he, he was filling me up. And in the first experience, in the first experience with him, one of the things he did was I saw him going up, up into the light. But then he came back down. And he said he, said he can do this anytime he wants. Anytime he wants to re refresh himself, he goes up towards this light and he feels filled again with energy and love and joy and enthusiasm and then he can go do what he wants. And we found out later he's being very creative. And But he said he can do this for me and that he does do it for me sometimes, that he fills me up. It's like filling, filling your gas tank is what he said. And so in this instance where I was remembering how tired I was, I felt him filling me up and, and I felt so good. I felt younger and younger and and, and happier and stronger, and I didn't want to stop, and I didn't want to come out of this and have to talk about it. I just wanted to stay there. So that was one. So then, and then the, the very last thing we did was Dr. Botkins asked me if I would ask Tom a question for him. So I said, sure. And so he, he asked me to ask Tom what he's doing now. You know, Tom seemed to be very creative in various things he's doing. What exactly is he doing? So the first thing he said, I saw him, I saw him. He said, he's, I'm trying to learn to, how to walk on clouds. And I saw his foot going through a cloud. And then he laughed and he said, I'm just kidding, of course. But, <laughs> I saw him in a, in a white gown with a halo. And again, he laughed and he said, it's just a joke, I really mean it. But, but, then, but then, I saw this a group, a group of people by him. And they were all in white gowns with halos. And again, they were all laughing. He said, it's, it's just a joke, it's just a joke. But the truth is, we are a choir. We are. And he said, you know how in, in, in our reality here, when we have choirs in the European tradition, we generally throw ourselves into a category of bass, tenor, uh, alto, and soprano, right? You know, you just choose one of those you're kind of close to. But he said, everybody's voice has its, is unique, and everybody has their own pitch and their own vibration. You know, every, everybody does. Maybe you notice that you can, even on the phone, you can kind of tell people by their voices. And he said, we are trying, 18 of us, trying to sing all together, being true to our true pitch, our true vibration at the same time. 
And he said, we, 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 we do slow things mostly, but sometimes we play around with sounds and do fun things. So that was one thing. And then another thing he said was, uh, see, he was a high school physics teacher in this reality. And he said, they're, they're, they're physicists in your reality, and there are non-bodied people here, like myself, who are, are working on quantum physics together. Those in your reality don't realize we're doing it together. <laughs> But we're, we're, trying to, um, we're trying to understand how consciousness forms into this thing that you call matter. Because, you know, we know that matter is almost empty space. It's almost all empty space. I mean, our scientists tell us that, that you know, most of an atom is empty space and most of, of, of every little part of everything is empty space. And how, how does consciousness form into what we call matter. They're trying to understand it and find a way to put it into words. And he said, it's awesome. He said, the smallest part of consciousness, the smallest part of existence is conscious. And, and, and he just had the greatest respect for these small, small, tiny units of consciousness, which are conscious. So those are a couple of the things that he's doing and that he shared with me and 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 I feel so close to him. Okay. I did want you upstage. Okay. <laughs> so much, Marty. Um, uh, by the way, Christopher Columbus wasn't the first here, uh, the, the, besides the Native Americans. The Vikings were way ahead of them, or him, and uh, Raymond Moody was way ahead of me, too. If, you've, if you're familiar with his book, Reunions, he uses a method based on um, ancient a practice of the ancient Greeks called the psychomantium. It's a darkened room with off offset light and so on. And about 50% of uh, uh, people that go through that experience some form of ABC. Um, IBC is a little bit more. It's it's a little more rapid, a little more reliable. Um, on the average, the, the last study, the Siena College. Uh, journal of Near-Death Study, um, on my 71 cases, it was 79%. And when I did my IEDC survey with people I had trained years ago, um, they, were, they reported a 75% success rate in terms of inducing ADC. Yeah, first. Um, so you talked about the questions, one about brain imaging research, what's being done and where you're trying to take it, and yeah. two, the patient's capacity to maintain IADCs after they've had the EMDR. Okay. Could you repeat the question? So on their own, I mean. Okay, the first one was about neuroimaging, what's going on there. And the, we really, the, I, I mentioned the University of Virginia study. Um, we're, we're running subjects, but we don't have any results in yet. And the other one was, oh, uh, the continuing. Patients' capacity on their own to continue IADCs. Okay. Can you say a few things about that? Many people, before they come to see me, say, well, once I have an ADC, I'm going to want to keep having them over and over and over again. And in, in fact, that doesn't, that's not the case. When, when people are sitting in the office and they, and they experience this ADC that's so profound and healing, um, they, they have no need to go back. They, they change their minds on that. Now, sometimes people don't have an ADC with me d during a, two weekend sessions, um, but because their sadness has come down so much, they oftentimes go home and have a spontaneous ADC. And I always tell people, if that happens, send me an email. You'll make my day. Um, uh, Sometimes people have an ADC, a continuing ADC, and don't want to have it. Um, 
Um, in fact, uh, I was working in Viet Vietnam five years ago, had a nice ADC, and this person kept coming back to him in the night, and he was creeped out by that. And so I said, well, the next time he shows up, you tell him th that he makes you feel uncomfortable, please stop doing that, which he did, and it stopped. Another one, one of my favorites, is a guy who was working on the death of an uncle who was like a father figure to him. And in the ABC, the uncle was standing there smiling, and next to him was the, the dog they, that my, my patient had grown up with, too. And, and the dog just sat there um, and well, while, the, while the uncle and my patient talked. And then the ABC ended there, and my patient comes up to me the next morning because all night something was jumping on me. <laughs> I didn't tell him what I thought, but I had an idea what that was. So we took him back to the ABC, and there was a dog, and, he, and so we played with the dog. Dog licked him, and he was jumping on him. And then my patient said, "Sit," and the dog sat and stopped jumping on him. Um, I've had three questions, and you answered it a little bit, and that is, you know, what is the pets? Do the pets, you know, ever give messages? Okay. And, but, it, it, okay, um, let, me, let me answer one at a time. I, I can't remember all okay, the okay. <laughs> um, in, in the work I do, pets are still pets. In other words, kitties pull, purr and rub their face on yours, and dogs bark and lick you and jump on you and wag their tails. Um, the, the, the love is, is still there and very strong, but we haven't had a case where the, a cat would sit down and expose quantum theory. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, didn't, didn't, you know, you deal with patients that have mental illness too. So how do you determine... Actually, not that much. Um, when I worked at the VA, and um, I mean, I worked with guys with PTSD. I mean, most of them had to, also had depression. Um, some were bipolar, but as long as they were controlled with medication, then they were fine. So I generally don't work with real severe cases uh, in terms of other other kinds of mental health issues. Well, let me just ask you this: when you're dealing with the elderly, and they might be, um, you know, having Alzheimer's or dementia. And they might be having hallucinations from that disease or from psychotic hallucinations. But then they start talking about a possible like ABC. It, but some of them are some of them are like a little positive, but lots of them are kind of more horrific. Yeah. You know, All ABCs we have done are positive. Okay. Every last one. And uh, the famous NDE guy, Ken Ring, once asked me, how can they all be positive? If some NDEs are negative. How can ADCs always be positive? Well, they just are, and that gets back to something you brought up earlier um, about forgiveness. We have ADC'd, in other words, br brought up a deceased person who was a very bad guy in life, Hor some horrible people. And in every one of those cases, without exception, the deceased came through as being very aware of the pain they caused on others, taking full responsibility for the first time ever, uh, being very sorry for it, wanting to do whatever they can to fix it. There are no excuses for it. They take it. Um, so, as Diane mentioned earlier, it certainly seems as though people have been through a life review. Um, as a matter of fact, I worked with a, a well-known physicist once, and he came in kind of skeptical. His wife dragged him in. And uh, while sitting in my office, he had his own life review just popped up. That's, that's only happened one time. In, in another case, um, I was working with a German woman whose uncle was a German soldier in World War II. Was a Nazi, and she felt bad about that. Well, in her ADC, she viewed her uncle responding to his own life review and, and, and feeling the pain as a result of his, his actions and so on. In other words, he, he, was, um, he, he didn't get away with anything. He, her, her, her uncle was dealing with it. 
How, how would they do that? I'm not sure. Oh, by the way, another similarity between NDEs, I don't know if I said this yet, and uh, IEDCs or ADCs, are these beautiful, rich landscapes. Did I mention that? No, 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 no that's my <laughs> you know, I, I, I've read a lot of a lot of NDEs, and it, this happens frequently in IADCs. People find themselves in a beautiful field with ponds, beautiful trees. One person said everything was so beautifully green, but it's it was the greenest green I've ever seen. Plants and 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 so on, and trees seem to radiate their own inner light. No snow? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I, you were next. Uh, I'm wondering if with your IADC technique, is the grief and sadness an essential component in triggering the experience? Or if you have relatives that might have died 20 years ago and they're just, they were fun people and you've long since processed their passing, but you might just like to say hi again and how are you doing, would that work? I get, I get uh, a number of calls like that and people say, you know, gee, I really don't have a loss in my life, but my, I lost my grandmother like 45 years ago, and I was sad at the time, but, you know, I'm over it. I don't have any more grief. Well, when those people come in, generally what happens is I start giving them eye movement, and they're crying. They didn't realize that they are still carrying this sadness over all those years. People, people, people can do a good job of keeping those emotions contained. And then they can easily get pulled up. Now I'm not saying, in some cases there may be none, but in almost all we've done like that, there, there was sadness they didn't recognize. I wasn't the exception to that, Alan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that I believe. <laughs> You're exception, an exception to a lot of things. Yo. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing track. Yeah. Um, would a person who has epilepsy be a deterrent in you doing a case of an IADC? That is a person having epilepsy? Yeah, if somebody who has epilepsy, would that be a deterrent, a deterrent um, in you doing That was a concern when EMDR first came out, that epilepsy would be a contraindication for eye movement. And we, the EMDR people looked at that very carefully, and they had no reports of eye movements triggering an a, a, a seizure. Yeah, I had a couple of uh, more technical questions. You, you know, obviously I had e EMDR training in 2001. Good. But as I've been watching the field, it seems like it's being eclipsed by other things. Yeah. And end of fold, I remember even back then stating, and she still maintains, that is, she felt that EMDR was nothing more than exposure therapy just done in the... Would you say Edna Fowler did say that? Yeah. 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 And currently now the VA is using some new stuff that she's doing that's more exposure therapy related. So where is MDR fit now where new therapies are coming up with trauma and... Uh, um. Yeah, you probably heard, heard me talk at the beginning. We believed we were doing in a, for, a form of exposure therapy uh, for years. And the gains we made were so minimal. Now, it's hard to imagine a, a, an exposure therapy that works better if exposure is, is the therapeutic ingredient. I mean, if it's just a you know, with eye movement, of course it's, you know, Edna Fuller and those people say, well, you're just using a form of exposure. Well, geez, if, I mean, if you're a clinician and you see the difference, I mean, you can expose somebody to a traumatic thing, and it'll likely fire, fire up that relieving component, and they won't sleep that night. Mm -hmm. If you eye move it, they go take a nap. I mean, the difference is huge. Another one? Technical? That was it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think. I was wondering if you've done, uh, I'm sure you have, but a lot of, of work with people who are uh, grieving someone who's died by suicide, and yes. if there's anything at all that's different about their experiences from the others. 
the only difference that um, I and other IEDC therapists have noted is that those who have suicided, first of all, they didn't accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, which was to, you know, to get out of their pain. Um, because when they suicide, they end up hurting a lot of people who cared for them. And now they have that additional issue to deal with. But in IEDC therapy, when we, you get that kind of communication going, that, that can be dealt with and resolved. I, I, yeah, I got it. I have one more question. Were you yeah. complete? Huh? Were you complete with what you just said? Was that what? Oh, were you complete in what you just yeah. said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's basically I, it. I have one more question. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to articulate it. I was wondering if, um, if you uh, believe that there might be something unique about you and the other people that you've trained, uh, like yourself yourselves as a variable in all of it. As opposed to the method. You mean, you mean in terms knowledge. of what would get people interested in the first place? No. Or, or when we do this work? Yeah, about your ability to get results. That's, an, that's a, yeah. an excellent question because when I train people, it, it seems to me, and this is more of a hypothesis, it seems to me that when we do this kind of work, we, we need to get out of the way. In other words, we set the, we set the table, we process the sadness, we bring it down, we give another set of eye movements, hopefully so this experience will then occur. But when we're doing that, we're out of the way. Our, our emotions can't interfere with what's going on across the table. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm going to say another thing, too. Um, another thing I forgot. If I would have written a whole speech, I would have <laughs> forgot these things. But, but when I worked at the VA, and this relates back to the forgiveness thing, when I worked at the VA, I worked with people who purposely killed other people. Mm -hmm. And in every case, that person got forgiveness. 100%. Now, first of all, this doesn't work with psychopaths because they, they have no sadness for their victim anyway. For this to work, you have to have sadness for the person that died. Therefore, you need to grieve the person you grieve for, the person you killed. You have to have sadness for that person. Your sense of humanity needs to be connected with that person you killed. If you don't have it, it's not going to work. And it's not an easy out, because then the, you really have to go through that painful grieving for somebody 20 years ago in Vietnam, you wanted dead and felt good when you killed them. But you know, the face comes back, the look on the face of the person you killed, and all the details that, you know, that you got to deal with. Does this technique process does this work for people who experience other traumas, not necessarily one that's directly involving someone's death? You ever hear that? Yeah. Yeah. No. Does this work with people who also have other traumas that don't necessarily involve death? Um, okay. I, I mentioned just briefly before that there are really two core issues when it comes to trauma work. One is fear, and one is sadness. In a fear trauma, you have fear that you or someone else is going to get hurt or die, and in a sadness trauma, someone dies. That's the only difference. Now, I always do the one, the component first, that's the most distressing. You always work top down. Worst first is the principle of IADC. So if a person has other traumas, that's fine. As a matter of fact, when I was at the VA, some of these guys had like 25 traumas. That's fine. As long as we're doing worse first, and going to work our way down the list. Yeah. So, did you have you ever done this work with somebody and had them go into a past life? No, never. So, do you guide them? Is there any? Guidance? I guide nothing. <laughs> and and 
to the extent, if, if I tried to guide people, it would stop working, it wouldn't work. If they tried to guide them, guide themselves, like I said earlier, that if people have beliefs and expectations and they try to steer it, it doesn't work. You've got to be wide open. As a matter of fact, even when you go from one experience to the next and you, and you induce another, you know, you, you go back and induce it again, you never bring up the, the experience you were just in. You have to be wide open every time. <coughs> People who meditate are very good at this because they know what it's like to slow down those thoughts that are always running in one's head. Um, probably the main reason why people can't experience an ABC in session, even though their sadness comes way down and they feel a lot of relief and they, they feel better in that way, They're, they can be disappointed they didn't also have an ABC. But the, probably the main reason is some people are just filled with constant chatter. They're always talking to themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, I'm doing this. They, they probably don't even do a good job of smelling a flower. You know, it's, it's an experience, you know. But you know, the person like that is well. Now I'm bending over. Now I'm picking up the flower. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard everything. Can you like share what was the most? Surprising to you, in with a person, a change or a conversation. Well, gosh, there, there, there are so many like that. I would, you know, but one thing that's interesting, um, just the word surprise, and I'm kind of take that. In. If I can think of something, I'll get back to you. But um, when people experience an induced after death communication. It's always kind of a surprise. It's, it's not what they expected. One woman saw her father s s sitting on a beach with a straw hat on. <laughs> Never expected that people in heaven would wear straw hats. <laughs> you know, it's always it's always unanticipated. So we can't guide it like hypnosis, where you were or you offer a suggestion, or you do guided imagery, or you know, you're moving people along a line. You can't do it that way, it doesn't work. Yeah? Do symptoms ever disappear, such as tinnitus? Yeah. Such as what? Tinnitus. Oh. Tinnitus. Tinnitus. Ringing in the ears. Oh, I, I couldn't hear you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, somebody had that lately. Wanted to know if it. I don't remember what happened. Or other uh, no, no, other no. Just, generally, anything physical. Although EMDR, standard EMDR, works well with chronic pain, where there's like a tension, increase the pain, pain increases, increases tension. Where there's that kind of negative feedback loop. EMDR does a beautiful job of um, of, of, of breaking that and, and reducing chronic pain, you know, not acute pain if you have a knife stuck in your I had it done, I did some EMDR once a long time ago. I can't even remember now what it was for, but I remember feeling for your like memory? it came to me. <laughs> <laughs> so for a memory problem? Yeah, I mean, it came to me the end of the reel, like a real uh, film, and it just flat, 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 and it was finished. And I can't even remember now what it was for. <laughs> Um, we've heard in this room a lot with NDEs, they um, come back with new um, new perspectives, feeling, you know, their yeah. lives can change a lot with right. service and they have a right. dedication to humanity. Right. Do you find that with your... No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me explain. <laughs> well, I'm going to explain that. That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Because Think of the difference between someone experiencing an NDE and someone reconnecting with somebody they've lost. The NDE, it's your life. It's everything is involved in this one. Whereas in a, when you're doing grief work and you have an ADC, that's just a little slice of life. So yes, an, an induced after-death communication, I've had atheists say now they believe, at least in an afterlife, they're absolutely convinced of it. So it, it changes that, and 
um, certainly makes them feel better, but they also have thoughts that change along with it. The NDE has a much more, I think, overall wider band psychological kind of change. So there's no like communication of of the cosmos, or they're not they're not given any um, you know higher knowledge that a lot of NDEs. You know um, that creeps in now and then. Um, Sometimes the answers we get, we don't understand. Um, I, I have kind of a long story, but I don't think it's... Oh, try it. You've done your... Right. <laughs> this, uh, the father lost a son, and he came in to see me, and the father and the son always had these philosophical, spiritual conversations. And, uh, and the guy asked me, before we started, if I believed in... Uh, in reincarnation. I said, well, I, I don't know. You know, I'm thinking about it. I don't know. I said something stupid from it. And uh, so anyway, at the end of the kid's beautiful ABCs with his son, and at the end he goes, I want to ask him if reincarnation is a reality. I go, Can I do that? And I go, sure, here. And I just, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he's sitting there with his eyes closed and he's laughing. And he's enjoying whatever it is that's going on. I can't wait to hear this. So he opens his eyes and he says his son showed him a series of pictures to, to, to answer his question. Now here, here's the series of pictures. I don't get it. Uh, my highly intelligent friend, uh, Dr. Grossman, got it. He couldn't even explain it to me, guys. I still can't get it. Um, first picture, there are ten people in a room, and there are nine doors. And those ten people exit through those nine doors. And they move into the next room, and now those ten people are in a room, and it has eight doors. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and in the last image, all ten people are going through the same door. Is that parallel universes, or what's that? Parallel universes. I know it's, it sounded to me like it sounded to me like the opposite of reincarnation. It's like it's the many coming to the one, as, as opposed to some kind of original energy bifurcating into the many. So I, maybe since there's no time on the other side, I'm looking at it. <laughs> maybe I should start at the end of the story. <laughs> I don't know. How many times have you done this with yours, those who have trained you, or um, that I've had the experience? Yes, sir. Twice. And um, I. We got five minutes left, and it's kind of really more personal than most ND or at most ADCs. Um, but I, I can tell you, they were both very surprising. It's not what I expected. Yeah. Um, I had a couple things. One is, what, would you tell us what antidepressants you would possibly recommend? I mean, I just have a couple people I know that might. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the more recent SSRIs, I think, are really good, like Selexa and Lexapro. And then, um, with, um, with my experience with the head trauma that I had, it has actually opened up the grief. I mean, yeah. that I, I mean, that I had, which without control. You know, like I, it opened it up for me. Like it's not. I don't really have. I don't know how to meet. I don't walk around crying, but it's there very strongly, you know, I know that. So, like the head trauma, I guess somebody else asked the question, I believe it would make a huge difference to me, like to, to have that therapy done because mm -hmm. it would release whatever's happening in my head from the head trauma too, from a car accident, you know. Yeah. First but, of all, it also depends on the neurology yeah. and what's going on in your head. Oh my God, it's right. going on here. One back there, yeah. Yeah, you. <laughs> Um, your experiences with regards to the ADCs, how have you dealt with um, people who have been murdered? How do you how do you then tell the patient 
or do you need to tell the patient to not go into certain areas? Like who killed you or how are you, how are you killed? <clears throat> Which if, then, which if, if I understand your question correctly, um, do sometimes people get legal or get information that impacts on legal stuff that's mm -hmm. going on exactly. which is, in, in this life? Well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so I have tried that a couple times. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in both, or I don't know, three, four over the years, in all of those cases, the deceased said, let it go, get over it, just forget it, drop it. Because the deceased somehow knew that that would be the best thing for their surviving person. I mean, even if you can get somebody to the electric chair that, that killed your loved one, um, and it might take you 30 years to do it. You know, what did you do to your life to, you know, to accomplish that? that, that that's kind of the way they, they over there kind of reportedly. Yes. Yeah. Um, do people who've lost children that are babies, when they see them um, through one of your experiences, do they have they grown? Can they can they talk to you? Let me start at the other end. When people are old and sick and they die, they're always young and healthy. People with severe dis disabilities, severely disabled, are not, no longer. People are younger, healthier, happier. But when it comes to children who die, it's a mixed bag, and I don't understand that. I don't know why. S sometimes they're still very little, sometimes they're grown. Like when I talked about Sam, the Vietnam vet, it was the 10-year-old girl that looked like she had grown into a 20-something-year-old woman. I was uh, wondering about I, it's, 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 it's kind of a funny thing. As a matter of fact, working with Marty helped me learn, learn this lesson when we were working together. I was talking to somebody once and I said, you know, they do a lot of fun things on the other side, or at least that's what my patients are saying. I have to work there. <laughs> but uh, uh, they play golf. They're on, they go pic on picnics. They go fishing. I never see any, or they, we never see them eat any fish. So I, know, I don't know about that part. But uh, and somebody said golfing. That wouldn't be any fun to golf in heaven. <laughs> who, who wants to have a hole in one on every hole? <laughs> I don't think it goes that way. Maybe. Golfing is still golfing. I don't know. Maybe you don't get as pissed off when you slice it. <laughs> I suspect and you, you can really make, make it more of a fun thing, but, but you're not all of a sudden a perfect golfer. And that's kind of what Marty was saying earlier when she was up here. It's not all of a sudden you're, you're there and the whole, you know, the Big Bang is revealed to you and, you know, quantum physics and everything all of a sudden makes sense. It's just, it, it's still a learning process. Um, a, a young woman who suicided was seen by her mother as giving a class to other de deceased people on suicide. <laughs> still learning. Yeah. I would just like to say that just how neuroplasticity shows us that the brain has ways of compensating. Yeah. I think that consciousness has a similar function where we can go into our spiritual selves. And I believe dissociation is one of those, you know, when we go in the shock state, that's one of those things. But it's that our consciousness brings a different aspect of our being to heal the trauma instead of, you know, just like a cognitive process would. But it's spirit coming in once we get over body and mind, spirit comes in to hold the full reality and this starts to open those pathways neurologically and otherwise. Very interesting. I'm going to think about that one on the way home. Maybe we'll talk. Yeah. I'm in your field. Oh, okay. Yeah. DSM. Three or four, or is it five now? It's five. Okay. Is there a, <laughs> is there a distinction? And, and they haven't got it right yet. But, uh, I think 
they're getting better. Is there a distinction between the grief and the depression that you yeah. identified in this? You know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for bailing me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in sort of in the way I describe it. The, it's, yeah. yeah, it sounds familiar. I mean, I just went you know, to a couple overviews, but yeah, you know, there's much better distinction between the two. Good, good, excellent. Yeah, I, I've, I've, of course, in Illinois, we have to get continuing ed now, so I'm getting a lot more than I used to. But I, I used to get it on my own. It's not like I gave up learning. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I went to an excellent uh, grief workshop, and they basically made the same distinction that I sort of gleaned from my own practice. I still think that your work is so extremely important. You know, it's just so, so important. And I hope you all carry this forth with you and spread it out there even more because it's, it's a wonderful gift to have you here. Before you get up, just sit there for just a minute. David, you're on. Oh, my shirt. Would you please run down and just oh. show off what you have on your body? I'm going to be a fashion model here. A fashion model. Look at this great t-shirt. Uh, sweatshirt. It says Chicago Irons on it. And it's beautiful. If you can have one on my yeah, look at the email that you received and click on that uh, link. And it's very comfortable, very nice. <laughs>